Oh, I'm fine with that, ma'am. I don't ha mind having a conversation with you or anybody else. But we will be civil. I know you. I've had a conversation with you. You've been civil to me before. I'll be civil to you. I don't want to go into full Mr. Batman mode. I'm trying to get away from that. Right, great. Um, yeah, well, maybe we can start and you can, um, you can lay out your, your view on how, um, on existence and, and God. Certainly. Premise number one, time, space, and matter exists. Premise number two, time, space, and matter had a beginning because it is all decaying to what's called heat death, thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium. Premise number three, the physical world that exists needs natural laws such as laws of gravity, magnetism, and thermodynamics to function, just a few of the necessary preconditions. Conclusion. There must be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, living, logical, lawgiver God. His name is Yahweh, Yahuvah, Yahushua, Yeshua. You might know him by his Greek name, Jesus. Okay. Okay, yeah, so that, that makes sense. Um, but so if you start with the, you know, that time, space, and matter exists, and then going going down from that, it makes sense There's a, there'd be a necessary precondition to that um and so but in, in working in working down from that um how would you know necessarily that what occurred in the christian bible is what um, is what that god is like that, that that explanation is matches with what that necessary precondition is that is uh you know i would say it has to be a positive force to contradict entropy um and that you know that, how, how would you how would you justify the, the story of the Christian God? I don't have to justify it, ma'am, because it's truth. Jesus said in John fourteen six, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. What he's doing here, he's actually quoting the Old Testament, where it says, Psalm 119, verse 160, the sum of your word is truth and all of your righteous rulings endure forever. See how that works? His laws endure forever. They don't ever change over time. He is Yahuwah. He changes not. That's in the book of Malachi. Now, sir, uh, ma'am, I could go through over and over again and show you this. But in order for you to know anything to be true, then you must have laws of logic, laws of identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle in order for you to know a true statement versus a false statement you need to be able to identify them that's the law of identity you need to compare and contrast them that's the law of non-contradiction and it's either true that the statement is either true or false that's the law of the excluded middle where do those laws come from and why do they not change over time yeah, they would need to be provided by the same thing that um, that would define time space and matter I'm sorry, you're breaking up, ma'am. Could you try again, please? <clears throat> sorry, they need to be provided by the same thing that uh, defines time, space, and matter. And what would that be? Well, that that would be God. And what God would that be? I, I'd say it's the, the God of the Bible. I think that um, under the correct interpretation that you could that, that you could definitely see that to be God. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Mm, but uh, once again, we have to understand what God says about his creation. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Did you know, ma'am, that this is a scientific equation that we were not even aware of until the late 1920s when Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion rate of our universe? This is why we had to come up with a theory called the Big Bang to explain the evidence we were already seeing. Uh, they, they thought, as a matter of fact, Einstein thought and had uh, put out the steady state theory. He thought that the universe stayed the same. It's static. But wait a minute. We see it's expanding outwards in all directions at, at simultaneously. Uh-oh. That means that everything had a beginning. Time, space, and matter had a beginning. Now, since everything had a beginning, anything that had a beginning, now here we go, we're talking about natural laws again. Anything that had a beginning is called an effect. Every effect must have an adequate cause. This is called the law of cause and effect. It doesn't change over time, and everything in the physical world suffers from it. 
Now, since time, space, and matter had a beginning, the only adequate cause of time, space, and matter by definition must be timeless, spaceless, immaterial, all-powerful, all-knowing, a loving, living, logical, lawgiver God. Yeah, that makes sense. It wouldn't, you couldn't describe it just using temporal or spatial properties. And that's interesting in the Bible. It says, so in the beginning, God created. So you did, there's no actions prior to the creation of time. And it's, yeah, I mean, if you read the Bible, you can see the, the scientific, um, our, our current scientific understanding just kind of threaded through the whole thing. Absolutely. And if I may, ma'am, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on Genesis 1 and verse 2. Because in Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, that's time, God, the agent behind the creation, created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. That's all time, space, and matter created in the very first verse of the Bible. But it gets even better than that. Because in verse 2, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the surface of the deep. Well, in Hebrews, it says, Everything in Scripture points to Christ. How does this point to Christ? Well, let me help you with that. When it says that word hovering in the original Hebrew, that's the word that we translate into brooding. That's what hens do to their eggs when they lay them. They spin them and warm them. They spin them and warm them. Do you know that God created all time, space, and matter in verse 1, and he gave it all spin in verse 2? Every atom, every molecule, every proton, every neutron, every planet, every moon, every galaxy has spin to it. Why? Because God gave it spin in verse 2. He created all time, space, and matter in verse 1, and he gave it all spin in verse 2. Okay. So, yeah, and that, that, that spin, is that what's allowed things to, be, to, to continue to develop? Is that what's allowed for, you know, for us to, you know, for, for people to have developed in animals? Because you do see that, through um, kind of the at least microevolution, you can see that um, even if you would describe to creationism, like you do see that positive development, even though we're in a world of entropy. Negative. Entropy is a, a thermal equilibrium. It's heat death. It's decay. It's order. To, it's from order to disorder. We never see the opposite direction unless there's a system built in place to overcome it. And even that system will succumb to entropy. When you are young, when you are first born, you, your body is overcoming entropy because you are growing. But your body is an intricate uh, irreducibly complex system that is designed to do that for only a short period of time. My body's no longer doing that. My body is succumbing to entropy because I'm almost 60 and everything hurts. Why? Because I'm decaying over time. So even the systems in play that can overcome entropy for a short period of time will succumb to entropy as well. Now, when you're talking about evolution, evolution is a lie straight from the pit of hell. It denies what God's word says. If you are a Christian, God's word says in the beginning, God created all life. And then life, man, caused death to come into this world. That Adam and Eve's sin caused death to come into this world. Now, evolution declares that there was death, and through all this death and change and reorder and disorder that happenstance and, and random chance, all of a sudden now you got life. But I've got a problem with that because I love biology. Now, let me ask you a question, ma'am. In our, in our bodies, we have a system called the circulatory system. I'm quite familiar with my circulatory system because I've had a heart attack or two. And do you know in your circulatory system you have your heart, which actually pumps the blood. Then you have the blood that takes the oxygen into your body and the carbon dioxide out of your body. And then you also have the veins and the arteries which take the blood all through your body. Now that's just pieces of this intricate system. There's many, many more. Not to mention that blood itself is irreducibly complex. Did you know that blood alone has a one 100 step cascade effect that is if you don't have step one happening the, uh, first and then step two and then step three and then step four for a hundred step process then your blood doesn't work properly it will if you get a paper cut and all of those steps are not in play guess what happens you bleed to death from a paper cut if all of those steps are not in play and guess what else could happen you stroke out your blood clots inside your veins kind of a problem so but let's not go though there just yet let's look at this system any system is a multitude of other parts that work together to perform a 
function. Okay, so we have this circulatory system. If evolution is true and it's not, which one of those pieces evolved first and how do you know? Well, that's, it would need, like, it would have needed to come initially, at least what had developed into it. So God would have had to have some sort of a play in it. Um, Actually, ma'am, that doesn't work either, because not only is this system irreducibly complex in its own right, and remember I said that blood itself is irreducibly complex in its own right, these irreducibly complex systems are interdependent upon other irreducibly complex systems. Your circulatory system is dependent upon what? Your respiratory system. Where do you think it gets the oxygen to go into your blood, and how do you think the carbon dioxide comes out of your body? through your respiratory system. Uh-oh, that system is irreducibly complex. But wait a minute, it gets worse still because that system is interdependent upon the muscular system and that system is interdependent upon the skeletal system and on and on and on and on. There's a myriad of irreducibly complex systems inside our human bodies. Evolution cannot explain any of those things. So, uh, so what would your, you had to explain exactly what happened um, for creation according to, in accordance with, with science and the Bible. How would you describe what happened? That God created in six literal 24-hour periods. We call them days. He rested on the seventh literal 24-hour period. We call that the Sabbath. And we call those conglomeration of days a week. He did so in six 24-hour periods. Now, it also says in the book of Exodus, in six days, God did all his work, and on the seventh day, he, he sanctified the Sabbath. So six days, that word yom there in the original language, Hebrew, yom, that can mean a number of different things. It can mean a day, course it can mean a long time frame an era an age it can mean like in the day of my father or in the day of babe ruth but every single time over 900 times in scripture when you see the word yom and it's combined with a number any number at all an evening or morning not all three of them but any of them then it's always a 24-hour period now let's look at genesis it says and there was evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the second day. Uh-oh, this is called emphasis. God is trying to make sure that you understand that these are 24-hour periods. Okay, um, so how would you say he created all of this? He spoke it into existence because he's all-powerful. Okay, so external form. I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Just so external from our, the laws that have been instituted since God would be all-powerful, you'd be able to then institute the changes you spoke of in the first six days. Um, and then the seventh day, the, the world was, was ready. Uh, you're still kind of breaking up, but I heard you say oh. something about laws. So God is able to alter the laws um, that he created so he would be able to create things in a way that the world wouldn't naturally produce. Well, God created some laws, yes. He created laws of physics. He created laws of cause, well, not cause and effect. He created laws of entropy. He, uh, he did create certain physical laws in our physical world. That's why they're called laws of physics. But... He did not create the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics. These laws are eternal, universal, and unchanging. Why? Because they must pre-exist the physical world. Let me ask you a question, Ms. Rise. Do you think the universe in the very beginning could have both existed and not existed at the same time in the same way? Um, not from the perspective of time and space, no. Correct. And that means that that is the law of non-contradiction verbatim. And the law of non-contradiction requires the law of identity for it to function. And it's either true that this statement is true or it's false. That's the law of the excluded middle. So right there proves that all laws of logic pre-exist the physical world. 
and they don't change over time. So since these laws pre-exist the physical world and they don't change over time, they must have an eternal, universal, and unchanging source. But wait a minute. These are attributes of the living God. Since God can set aside laws of biology, he actually caused Mary to be born, caused Jesus to be born of a virgin by Mary. That's setting aside a law of biology. He actually caused the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the dead to raise. He sets aside those laws of biology. How can he do that? Because he created those laws. But God did not create the laws of mathematics and he did not create the laws of physics. They are his, or excuse me, the laws of logic. They are his attributes. They are his properties. Let me ask you a question, Ms. Rise. Do you think that God could make a rock so large that he himself could not move it? Well, I think that God could uh, alter what defines that but God would not be, or like, so it, it, you're asking me if God could do something like that, but that's not, that question is not something that makes sense in terms of what God is. Exactly. Thank you for noticing. And you know what? I must applaud you. You're one of the first people to pick up on that. The fact of the matter is God cannot violate his own attributes. If he could make a rock so large that he himself could not manipulate it, then he would now no longer be the all-powerful creator God because he created something that he wasn't all-powerful over. So the, guess what that would violate? That would violate the law of identity. Oh, that's a problem. Yeah. So, ma'am, once again, I don't mind having a conversation back and forth with you. You're asking questions. We're having a good discourse back and forth. Thank you very much. But this other gentleman, not so much. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been interesting. And I like, I think it's interesting to talk about from a logical scientific perspective, the, how we, how we describe, um, how we describe things from a theological perspective as well, because they go hand in hand. So I think that it's important to incorporate that scientific perspective in when we discuss when we discuss theology, they're not two separate things. Um, and I, yeah, so, so that's, I've, I've enjoyed talking about that too. I feel like a lot of times people are just like, oh, have, or, you know, discount some of the scientific things that we've derived. And you can't necessarily just do that. It's, it's, and that doesn't bring you to an actual understanding. That's quite correct. And in order to have understanding, Understanding requires reasoning, and the necessary preconditions of reasoning and intelligibility are laws of logic. And in order for us to observe laws of logic, where do we observe them? We observe them inside of time, space, and matter. But wait a minute. Time, space, and matter doesn't work by itself. It requires laws of physics. So, again, everything in the creation declares the handiwork of the Creator. This is called a revelational epistemology. So, um, so how would you, so would you say God, um, God defines the laws, that defines the laws of logic, or how would you say they fit into this? They are his attributes. They are his properties. This is how his mind thinks. His mind works logically and mathematically. Why do you think these laws are universal and unchanging? Why is it we can take the Hubble telescope and look billions of light years away and be able to identify planets, moons, stars, things like that, galaxies, universes. I mean, what it was not universe, but galaxies. How, how is it we can do that that far away? Because these laws are eternal, universal, and unchanging. If they weren't, then we could not observe things in the real world. God wants us to know things. God wants us to know him. Yeah. And that's like the thing is, I think it's not when you're not sinning, it's not about getting away with, it's not, it's not like you have to, you have to not sin or that you, if you're sinning, that you're getting away with not doing something that's right. 
what you're doing is you're actually doing something that is hurting you and not realizing that you think that you're being selfish, but really you're hurting yourself because it is in your self interest to act in line with the universe and those laws of, of nature and laws of science and logic. Because if you don't actually act in line with those, then you're going to be doing something that's self-destructive. Um, and uh, people don't understand that it's actually in your self-interest to believe and follow God. Um, yeah. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, God makes it ever so clear when he says, I put before you this day life and death, blessings and curses. The blessings and the curses are the Torah his instructions, his Bible, his word. And you know what? He has a whole chapter in there about how he's going to bless you if you will obey the Torah. He says, I'll bless you going in. I'll bless you coming out. I'll bless you. I'll bless your wife. I'll bless your kids. I'll bless your family. I'll bless your house. I'll bless every place where your foot lands. But you know what? He also has another chapter about what happens when you don't obey the Torah. He goes, I'm going to curse you going in, curse you going out, curse you, your family, your kids, every place that your foot lands. And you know what? This is called the law of cause and effect. You reap what you will sow. Definitely. I mean, it's like, if you act in that way, it's you who's isolating yourself away from God and moving away from God and your own existence. You know, it's not God taking it from you. You are choosing to take yourself away from existence and God. Well, the other thing you have to understand, too, is when you are trying to take yourself away from God, you are engaging in what's called anomia. That's uh, the original Greek word for without Torah, without law. Now, let me ask you a question, Miss Rice. This is not directed at you, but do you know what the scientific definition of a pervert is? Um, probably someone who uses something... It's not what it's intended to, so not using something for its intended purpose. Almost. It's quite correct. You're, you're very much, uh, very close. Again, a pervert is anybody who takes any system whatsoever and uses that system in a way it was never designed to be used, which deforms or destroys the function of the system. So in essence, if you are perverting the designer's intended plan, then guess what you're doing? You're sinning. A pervert is a sinner. We know that the function of the human body, and if you pervert that human body, then you are sinning against the designer of the human body. If you take a cell phone and you use that cell phone to hammer a nail in the wall so you can hang a picture of your boyfriend on the wall, you just perverted that cell phone. You became a cell phone pervert. Now, that's not a sin because God doesn't really care what you do with your cell phone, but he does care what you do with your body because he gave that to you. He created it specifically for you so you could know that he is. Yeah, that's what like our lives are for, I think, too. Um, so I guess, how would you say that we can actually fully know what we need to do with our, our in our own lives, like relative to us? Because... I mean, we have the Bible, but obviously it's been interpreted in an infinite amount of ways. So no, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, incorrectly. No, ma'am. That's not the truth. Now, now you've been fed some propaganda that's not true. We have one Bible. We have one scripture. Now, that one scripture has been translated into many different languages, many different times, and many different flavors of different languages. Again, these translations always come with a little C right next to them. I want you to pay attention to this, where it says New King James or New International Version or Revised Standard Version. There's going to be a little C right next to that. You know what that stands for? Copyright. That means that somebody had to change something so they could make money. So don't look at any one translation. Go back and look at the original documents. Go look at multiple translations. Go look at the go get a Greek and Hebrew concordance. They're free online. Um, uh, what was that? Blueletterbible.org is a great free study tool. And you can go look at these original words. Ma'am, we know what God says. And you know what? God's word is not difficult. That's Jeremiah. And also in Romans. Uh, no, in John, it's First John. Anyway, God, Jesus came to do away with all these man-made laws so we could just do what he gave us to do. He said, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. 
come and follow me. We're not supposed to follow a pope or a poop. We're not supposed to follow a pastor or a, a priest or, or a, a parishioner or a church. We're supposed to walk as he walked. Now, let me ask you a question, ma'am. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey the commandments. What commandments do you think he's talking about? So you mentioned the, the like to the two of their being like to, to love your God and then about loving your neighbor as yourself. So, I mean, essentially, it seems like his message is that that's how you're supposed to um, understand and interpret and, um, and act in life. Actually, ma'am, you would be wrong here. And this is why you need to read your scripture, not listen to what people have told you what scripture says. You actually quoted part of it quite correctly. When asked, Jesus was asked, Rabbi, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus said, the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the second is as the first, love others the way you love yourself. And like you, most people stop right there. But I recommend starting again at Matthew 22:40, 40, because Jesus himself says, on these two commandments, what? Hang all the laws and the prophets. So, ma'am, it's not just two commandments. It's the entirety of the Tanakh. That's the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim. This is what we call our Old Testament. Jesus did not come to do away with any of the laws. They are all still valid. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the laws of the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So this is called a true dichotomy. Abolish cannot mean anything like the word fulfill. So let's look at that word fulfill in the original Greek. That's the word pleureo. And you can look this up yourself in a Greek concordance. That word pleureo does mean uh, to complete, but it also means to fully make it known, fully live it out, fully preach it, bring it to its full spiritual meaning. You know what? Jesus said, you've heard it said you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you've looked on a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart already. Would you agree that that's bringing that up to a higher spiritual meaning? Yeah, and that word fulfill is interesting because Jesus in his life, that's what his life was, is fulfilling like what, what he, it was demonstrating what, like, what God's will is. And you like I think I, I yeah I agree on the the Ten Commandments. And you look at the Old Testament. What Jesus did is he showed how like the the um, God's will was exemplified to the Jews through their religion in the Old Testament, but that Jesus brought it up and through parables and through um, through his teachings and through his life was able to demonstrate to people um, the meaning and the essence of what that is and so that other people could translate that down to their own lives and their own societies, like, but, and, but understand that meaning behind all of it. Cause, and what had happened in Israel is that they had just totally lost the, the meaning of it so much so that they essentially killed, <laughs> killed the meaning when it came to them. Uh, ma'am, I'm going to disagree with you here. Why did Messiah have to die? Well, I think that he had to die in order for the message to to be. Well, he had to die accord, in accordance with the prophecies of the Old Testament. That was a part of the Old Testament. But he also was he his life and his death was what was necessary in order to in order to spread what God was, have us understand and save us in terms of allowing us to align ourselves with God. So it was it was he had to die in order to. To fulfill. I'm sorry, ma'am. Um, you said a whole bunch of nothing. Uh, the fact mm -hmm. of the matter is, Jesus is our big churchy word here, propitiation. Have you ever heard of this? Um, I haven't, no. Propitiation is a substitutionary sacrifice. Have you ever heard that Jesus is our Passover lamb? Yeah, I've heard that that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world? Yeah. Great. Show me that in the Old Testament where one man can pay the price for any other man's sin. Show me that you can have human sacrifice. Show me any place where God himself can pay the price for mankind's sin. Um, I, haven't, I don't see that. 
I know, because you haven't looked. I'm going to give you some homework. Are you ready? Yeah. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 36. 18 is only about 32 verses. It'll take you about five minutes. This is the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus himself was preaching when he was on this planet. Do you think Jesus was preaching, hey, boys and girls, guess what? I'm the Messiah, and I'm going to die for your sins, and all you've got to do is acknowledge that I'm God, and everything's all good. Keep going, living, doing what you're, what you're doing, you know, wherever you're doing it. Don't care. No, not at all. He said you had to repent. That word in Greek is metanoia. That word in Hebrew is teshuva. Teshuva is to a 180 degree military turnaround with obedience. You are now going to obey the living word of God. Ezekiel chapter 36, well, starting around verse 24, you're going to find out what happens when you get the gift of the Holy Spirit because God wants to see you have a broken heart over your sin. How do you know what sin is if you don't know what the law is? Paul himself said, the law is a schoolmaster and it taught me what righteousness is and it taught me what sin is. Yeah, Jesus had to come show that. Um, he showed us. That yes, he, he showed us that he could live it perfectly, but that doesn't mean he had the right to pay the price for our sin. Why did he have to die? Well, you ready? Um, ready for your homework? Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's look that up together, shall we? I'm pulling up my Bible verse now. My computer is a little slow. I apologize. Okay. I mean, the Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, have you seen what she did? Talking about Israel. That faithless one, Israel. Oh, and by the way, if you're not grafted into Israel, then you're not saved. Because Jesus said he has only come for the lost sheep of Israel. Have you seen what that faithless one, Israel, has done? How she went up on every high hill under every green tree and played there the whore? Yes, he's talking about us. We've sinned against God. Every high hill, that's where they would build their altars. Every under green tree, that's Christmas trees. That's how they used to do worship there. That's the penis of Ra. Don't worship under your Christmas tree. And I thought after she had done all of this, she would return to me. But she did not return turned to me and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She saw that for all her adulteries that that faithless, faithless one, Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stone and tree. That's idolatry. Yet, for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart either, but in pretense, declares the Lord. And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt, that's repentance, that you have rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors, that's been a whore, among foreigners under every tree that you have sorry, that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Again, this is Jesus telling us what we did. We are whores, and he is the bridegroom. He's our husband. Now, let's go look at, I believe it's Romans chapter 7. Wait, so, so in the Bible it says that the only sin that cannot be forgiven is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Now, in the way that they were acting and the way that they were practicing faith and the way that they were teaching in so much as they actually ended up murdering Jesus. They didn't murder I, Jesus, ma'am. That's wrong. They didn't? No, ma'am. Do you think anybody can murder God? I'm oh, sorry, the, the, um, the human aspect of Jesus. No, sir. No, excuse me. No, ma'am. No, 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 no. Jesus laid down his life willingly. 
He willingly went to that cross. He could have called down a legion of angels, but he didn't need that. He could have done it with one. He could have done it with a snap of his finger, like Thanos, if you want to go that route. The fact of the matter is, he, there's no greater love than when a man lays down his life for a friend. That's what Christ did for us, and that's what I'm getting ready to prove to you. Because Romans chapter 7, released from the law. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, the Torah, that the Torah is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Uh Uh-oh, but if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Guess what? This is why Jesus had to die. Because we, the bride, were were unfaithful to him. We were whoring around on every high hill, under every green tree, getting on our backs for every false god we could get on our backs for. And the husband, God himself, Jesus, had to die for our sins. That's why he had to die. Now, why did he have to rise? Well, now that we're no longer an, an adulteress, now, now we are a, bl- a blameless, uh, clean bride. We can be married. But wait a minute. Our husband's dead. That doesn't do us much good if he's dead. So now he rises from the grave, conquering sin and death so he can be reconciled to us. That is is why Messiah had to die for our sins and rise again from the scripture. Why did God make malaria? So, I gotta go walk my dogs. I do apologize, but ma'am, it has been a real pleasure chatting with you, but my dogs are pawing at me and I do not want to clean up any pee. Okay, yeah, no problem. It'd be nice to maybe talk to some other... It's interesting to hear from you on it because you seem really informed on the story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you all have a good evening. Repent or perish. Repent and believe the gospel. Have a great day.